Welcome to another episode of the Manufacturing Executive Podcast. I'm Joe Sullivan, your host and a co-founder of the industrial marketing agency, Gorilla76. When you think of technology hubs in the US, where does your head go? Silicon Valley, Boston, maybe Austin, Texas, but why not the Midwest? Well, today I'm talking with the founder of an AI robotics software company out of Columbus, Ohio, who'd put Midwestern talent up against anyone. In our conversation, you'll hear his story and also his perspective on where the AI and manufacturing automation revolution are taking the industry. Let's get into it. Andy Lonsberry is CEO and co-founder of Path Robotics, a Columbus, Ohio-based AI robotics software company. While working on their PhDs at Case Western Reserve University, he and his brother discovered a market need for industrial welding robotics. From there, they founded Path Robotics, where they worked to redefine and re-energize American manufacturing. Andy earned his degree in mechanical engineering at The Ohio State University. Andy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Joe. Great to be here. So Andy, before we get into it, I was wondering if you could just start things off by telling us a little bit about your personal journey and kind of how Path Robotics came to be. Uh, not a problem. Um, so Path Robotics started um, while I was doing my PhD. Um, at the time, I was focusing on machine learning and artificial intelligence for bipedal walking robots. My brother was focusing on biologically spiking recurrent neural networks. So in general, both of us were really focusing on uh, machine learning and allowing high degree of freedom nonlinear systems learn how to improve themselves. While we were doing our PhDs, um, we kind of always know that we wanted to start a company, but we just didn't know what to do. I think a lot of what we'd seen in academia was great research being done. And sometimes people taking that great research and throwing it at a market and it never quite sticking right. And it always felt to us like it was a little bit like the cart was before the horse. Um, it was this great piece of tech and not really a market understanding. And instead we wanted to flip that. We really wanted to find um, a great market pain point um, and then create a product that could help really address that pain point. But we didn't know what that pain point was. So um, we set off by building a, a consulting company, a consulting firm. And we started exploring Northeast Ohio's manufacturing market. And the goal here was to not only be able to help people on a day-to-day -day with the consulting business, but eventually find a market pain point that was so big based on so many customers that we were talking to that it would make sense to turn um, our consulting business into a real company building a product. Um, so it sounded great to us at the beginning. We were like, this is awesome. We're going to be able to figure this out in a couple of months. It just didn't quite happen that fast. Yeah, it was a long journey for us, about 24 months of exploration. Um, we were talking to all sorts of different companies. We were looking at vinyl record pressing. We were looking at medical automation. Uh, we were looking at transmissions. Um, we were kind of looking at just a lot of different markets and really trying to understand, again, where a pain point or if there was a pain point in the manufacturing industry that could really utilize our backgrounds and our skill set to help create a product uh, solution for that. So, you know, we're, we're exploring Northeast Ohio's manufacturing market. Time is going by. We haven't found really a market pain point yet until, of course, there's that one faithful day. Well, we're at a customer's facility. We're there to talk about finite element analysis. And the president of the company walks in and basically says, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about welding. And he goes on to tell me the story about how they have this big pain point and it all revolves around finished welding. They're having a hard time hiring welders, they're having a hard time retaining welders. Anytime they bring in somebody new that's never welded before, it takes them three to six months of apprenticeship to become a certified welder at their facility. And it's really becoming this bottleneck that's not allowing them to grow. They had two options that they were looking at. One was offshoring potentially, um, but they were worried about losing quality. They weren't hitting the normal numbers you would need to really make offshoring worth it in terms of like seeing hundreds of thousands of the exact same part. They're a high mix, low volume company. They are cash flow business. So they want to uh, make what is ordered that day 
and they want to produce it. They don't want to make 10,000, 100,000 of the exact same thing and put it on the shelf and sell it out throughout the year. They have 3,000 different parts. And so again, offshoring didn't really quite make sense. Their other option was looking at robotics. And uh, it sounds like a good thing, like industrial robots. You've seen what other people have been able to do with them. So they actually purchased a cell. Um, they found out that classic industrial robots though, aren't really viable for a company like them that have uh, not super tight tolerances because everything's handmade. Again, they're making different parts every single day. They would have need custom fixtures, custom robot programs. They'd need a whole systems engineering team to really make an industrial robot work. And so it was never able to actually work for them. What they really wanted was just more human welders. And that wasn't possible. So they posed us the question, could you replicate with a robotic arm, a system that could represent uh, as close as possible, some of our human welders so that we could just be able to put in one of any of the SKUs into a three jaw chuck, you would be able to press one button and the system would be able to scan, recognize on its own what it should be welding and determine how to weld it and then perform the welding process. That's when we kind of take a, a step back. We looked at the market. We found that this is a pain point that was felt not only by them, but by many. We decided to make that jump and jump into the, the welding industry. And that's really when the journey kicked off of, um, well, now we have a pain point. How do we go make a solution? Happy to talk about that next part of the journey as well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, just that, to, oh man, what was that moment like when when all of a sudden you realize like, wow, there's there is something here. There's a big hole, and we might be able to fill it. Yeah. No. It felt one. It felt great because we had been exploring for literally like 24 months um, for that for that hole, um, and it just kind of felt like it was something that connected so well with what my brother and I were doing from a research perspective. You know, we needed something that could adapt, that could learn, that could use vision, that could use other inputs to make decisions on the fly. Again, that was something that was like really core to our, um, you know, our technical backgrounds. And then two, the fact that it had to do with welding, um, both my brother and I, we've been kind of ingrained in manufacturing for a very long time. We've been welding um, since the ages of eight, nine and 10. Uh, we've been making custom motorcycles for a long time. It just was something that just really spoke to us as well and just felt really natural. So it was super exciting to finally feel like, hey, this is the market. This is what we're going to go do. Let's put it in stone and start marching forward towards it. That's awesome. How long ago was this, Sandy? Oh, um, so I want to say this was in 2016, 2017. Okay, cool. So fill in the gap then between then Maybe. and now. Yeah, so... Um, worked with that company. They gave us the initial funding to go create this system. Um, my brother, myself, and my other two co-founders, uh, which was my, my father and uh, another guy named Matt Klein, uh, you know, basically went to a, a basement. Uh, we carved out a small space in a basement of a foundry. Um, I think it was roughly like 200 square feet, so 20 by 10. Uh, we put two robots into that little space with us and we started building out what would be the first you know fully autonomous robotic system that was also a you know a long process uh, we saw a, a lot of hurdles that came at us as we were trying to build um, we saw a lot of technical challenges um, that came that you know, kind of surfaced as again making a system learn how to do something uh, is challenging using vision as the main input and feedback is also not a not an easy system, easy, uh, easy task. Um, but after grinding for quite a long time in that basement and, and living through some unique experiences of what it's like to, you know, really live in a basement, um, after months, you know, we came to the surface, we had those two prototypes, we deployed them at the customer's facility. They run two today currently. Uh, they're making, you know, hundreds of mufflers a day uh, with those systems. And then, once we deployed them, we had to make a choice. Do we want to continue to grow organically or do we want to accelerate? I was pretty adamant that I wasn't really going to go back to that basement. Um, and I wanted to accelerate our growth. So we, <laughs> we decided to fly it to Silicon Valley. Um, we were taking a shot at the venture capital market. Um, at first, we were super concerned. Um, it's a couple Ohio boys going to the West Coast. 
didn't quite know how it was going to be received, but having an autonomous robot with us gave us a lot of credit. Um, and we were able to close that first piece of funding rather quickly, came back to Ohio with uh, you know, two and a half million dollars for our first seed run, seed round. Talked to um, a couple venture capitalists here in Columbus, gathered some excitement very quickly around what we were doing. And then we closed our twelve and a half million dollar series A, you know, a couple, a couple months after the series seed. So at the end of 2018, to put some timeline on this, we closed about $15 million in funding. We were a very small company, just a handful of people moved out to Columbus and really started building what is Path Robotics and started building out the company that we wanted to create, which is the system of, you know, from the product perspective, it's fully autonomous welding, smart, intuitive system that can learn, that can make decisions on its own, and that really utilizes vision as its, its core input feedback. You know, fast forward to today, we just announced our Series B um, funding. It was led by Addition. We're utilizing that capital to continue to expand uh, into our vision and continue to expand into making robots more intelligent and more adaptable to their environments. So Andy, I'm a Midwestern guy, born and raised in Milwaukee, and I've lived my entire adult life in St. Louis, where my business partner, John, and I have built our agency over the last 15 years. And I've heard you talk about how you take pride in your Midwestern roots as well, um, but also that you've uncovered so much talent in the Midwest. For you specifically, it's been in Ohio. So just kind of curious if you can talk about that. Let's give, give the Midwest a shout out here and just kind of hear, hear your side of that story. Yeah, the Midwest is has been exceptional. So I, I'm born and raised in the Midwest, um, grew up in Ohio. Uh, you know, my family had a machine shop in Youngstown, Ohio, actually born Ohio for a long time while I was younger. So really have just kind of been ingrained in manufacturing, ingrained in the Midwest for my entire life. I think a big part of what this company is and who this company is, um, is represented by my Midwest roots and by the Midwest roots in general that we have at PATH. And what we've seen to be just phenomenal, uh, phenomenally successful for us is hiring people in the Midwest. Um, when I started this company and after we got funded and uh, funded from Silicon Valley, there's always that concern that you know, we would need to move to Silicon Valley to really get the best talent, uh, or we would need to move to the East Coast to be able to get the best and it's just not the case. It's not what we've seen at all. Um, we've seen that the talent here in the Midwest is exceptional. Um, on the engineering side, on the machine learning side, on the AI side, there's really, really great people here uh, near us. And we are trying to cultivate and really go after that talent source as much as possible. I think Pittsburgh has really also helped set off the talent in the Midwest. Um, they're known as a city for robotics right now. They have one of the fastest growing robotics scenes um, kind of in the world. And we're trying to have Columbus also get in there, but it's not just Ohio. It's not just um, Pennsylvania. We're seeing it kind of all over the place in the Midwest that the talent is real. It's here, it's in numbers, and we're trying to cultivate as much as we possibly can from it. That's cool to hear. Yeah. And you probably as an Ohio state guy wouldn't want to admit it, but I know there's a ton of, a ton of great stuff going on in Michigan as well. Um, on the robotic side, we, we've got, you know, a client there and we've, um, I just see a lot of a lot of companies in the robotics world popping up in, in Michigan and, um, you know, throughout, but yeah, throughout the Midwest, I'm, I'm in the marketing industry, obviously, but there's a lot of talent here and, uh, you know, the cost of livings is great. And it's, it, you know, there, these cities are, are like advancing. There's some great universities like here in St. Louis is Washington university and St. Louis university that breed a lot of really smart young talent. And it's, it's we got to keep these people here in the Midwest though, I think it's part of the challenge. So. Definitely. I totally agree. I think um, uh, Washington and St. Louis is an exceptional school. Um, I actually think that's where um, our, our, most, uh, our, our most recent fundraiser, our fundraise uh, was led by Addition and the head of Addition, Lee. I think he actually went there for his MBA. So he's got, he's got roots in the Midwest as well. And yeah, he uh, you know, supports what we're doing also because we're doing it here in the Midwest. And you know, we're very close to our customer base um, as well, which is why we wanted to stay here. That's awesome. Wash U happens to be uh, my alma mater. So it's what brought me down to St. Louis and kept me around. So <laughs> um, awesome. cool. Well, let's, all right, let's shift gears back to AI and robotics here. So, um, you know, I've had a handful of guests on recently, Andy, that have come from one corner or another of the manufacturing automation world. 
And I was just, I'd like to hear you give your perspective on how machine learning and AI are just starting to change the game and will continue to change the manufacturing landscape. Yeah, of course. Um, so again, my research really focused on machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, so did my co-founder, um, my brother, my co-founder. His research also really focused on it. So I, I feel like we have like a, a deep connection to the low level functionality of how machine learning really works. And we feel very strongly that it's gonna have a huge impact um, on all sectors that affect our daily lives and machine and uh, manufacturing obviously being a big part of that. So uh, manufacturing for a long time, um, there hasn't been a lot of intelligent systems deployed in manufacturing. Um, there's been some great machinery. It's come from you know CNC technology and whatnot. And that's really, you know, pave the road for um, you know, manufacturing as to today. But I think that next step level up is going to come from machines learning from themselves and machines being able to take um, uh, data on based on what they've just accomplished and be able to tweak themselves completely. And I think that's the big, big change that we're going to see here going uh, into the future is how to enable machines, again, to make smart decisions on the fly and why it's so important, I think, in manufacturing, especially the manufacturing that I focus on, which is, again, high mix, lower volume, when every part is running at a skew of 10 to 100, or, or maybe even a skew of one. Um, it's really, really tough to not have an intelligent operator or intelligent system um, be doing that operation. Um, it really, really takes usually some sort of operator interaction or skilled um, labor interaction to be able to do something like that. Um, most of the time, when you think about manufacturing at scale, you think about somebody that's making 100,000 to a million of the exact same thing. At least that's the picture that kind of comes into you know, my mind when I used to think about manufacturing. And it's just not the case. There's so much manufacturing from fabrication, you know, metal fabrication to small runoff. And that really is a very difficult thing for anyone to use any sort of automation in that sort of sense. And I think personally, to be able to move into utilizing automation and um, low volume runoffs, you're going to have to have a system that can adjust on the fly based on what it's seeing and based on what's asked of it at hand. And to me, that's the big impact that machine learning is going to help um, change the game on. That's a good perspective. Um, you know, is there anything, Andy, you'd like to comment on in particular about the welding industry and, and what's what you see happening in the years ahead? Yeah, so I think right now the welding industry is... Um, it's going through a change like a lot of other industries. Um, you know, currently we're seeing this massive demand for welding. I think we're seeing massive demand for manufacturing uh, in general right now. COVID drastically showed some weaknesses uh, in our supply chain kind of across the board. And I think more emphasis again is coming back on local manufacturing and, and just not in the United States alone. This is happening, I think, I'm kind of all over the world where there's this there's this additional momentum around local manufacturing. And for us in the United States, you know, manufacturing for quite some time has been you know, changing and evolving. A lot of it has gotten shipped off shores. And again, as things broke in our supply chain, this revitalized the need for more local manufacturing. And welding is such a key piece of manufacturing. I think it's 50% of all man-made products in the United States have some sort of welding process being done to them. And so we see this massive, massive need for more welders, more welding in general. And again, we're not seeing that same demand be matched by uh, the number of uh, workers entering the welding occupation. And for us, we're seeing this as, you know, again, the reason why we're building what we're building. We're trying to help revitalize and re-energize and give as much support as we can to local manufacturing by giving them the tools that they need to, to be able to continue to scale and to continue to bring manufacturing back to the United States and to continue to hardening the manufacturing um, you know, world here in the United States. But again, also everywhere is, you know, there's a, a local manufacturing is just going to be uh, continue to be, I think, a big issue for uh, most people throughout the world. I sound like a broken record when I say it, but every every podcast episode I have one way or another, um, you know, the 
lack of of skilled workers and and labor shortage it's affecting everybody it really appears to be the biggest challenge that uh, american manufacturers are facing right now yeah i would totally agree uh, at least from the companies that i talked to i mean i talked to a company today um, that had to just pass on a 10 million dollar order um, because they didn't have the capacity to be able to support that order. Um, And they're really looking to us to help them make that order happen. Um, And so we see it again, everyone that we're talking to is running into this issue and they want to be able to grow. They want to be able to sustain um, the momentum they're getting and they're feeling from their customer base. And um, with welding being just such a vital part to that manufacturing process, we see this uh, kind of happening day in, day out right now. I'd believe it. Andy, I heard you recently use the acronym RAS or Robot as a Service. I was wondering if you could talk about what that is and um, how you see this concept maybe starting to take root in the manufacturing sector right now. Yeah. So Robots as a Service, I think, is a, a newer term um, that's been around for maybe a couple of years, but certainly not decades by any by any means. And the whole concept of robots as a service is that classic industrial equipment is usually purchased on you know, a capital expenditure. And it's usually a one-time upfront cost to pay for that piece of equipment that would get paid back um, over years. That has been a long-standing practice for them, especially in the manufacturing environment. And I think um, large tier one people, um, again, where cash isn't uh, a, a problem to go get and buy equipment, you know, they might be standing by this practice for uh, a long time in the future. But what we're trying to do is enable small to medium-sized manufacturers to be able to utilize robots immediately. And Um, Utilizing them as a service allows us to deploy robots quickly, effectively, and we get to take the burden on that the system either works or you don't pay for it. And so how the system works and how robots as a service works for us is there's no CapEx spend. You sign up to a subscription for our robotic system. We deliver the system. We tell you the quality metric, we tell you the KPIs around cycle time that you're going to see on your parts. And that system has to perform every single day or you don't pay. And so what we're trying to do is enable these manufacturers to be able to move into automation immediately. There is no large CapEx spend up front. They don't have to go try to get the cash to make that happen. They are looking at something that's very comparable to their labor prices and their labor costs that they can put onto their OPEX spend and immediately be utilizing robots to continue to expand their manufacturing operations on day one and not three years down the line. And again, they're going to see that return or that um, return on their spend immediately. It's not a, a three or two or two or three year payback period. It's an instant. So in the first hour that our system's deployed, our customer is making money uh, based on our, our subscription. It feels like a fantastic model to me. I mean, it seems like you guys are emulating what what happens a lot in, in the software industry. Um, and it only makes sense that, especially where, like you said, where companies are used to dealing with you know, these large capital expenditures. Um, now you can put these things on site immediately without the huge upfront cost. And the, some of the risk is is on you rather than them, which is, you know, kind of lowers the barrier to entry. So smart, smart way to go. I'm curious to see how it plays out in the years ahead. Yeah. Thanks Joe. And that's a big thing that you, that you touched on there, the risk, you know, we're trying to take on as much risk as we possibly can. We've seen, and we've talked to a ton of customers that have purchased robots and uh, they were sold a pipe dream when they bought that robot, um, but they still paid for it and they're still trying to make it work. We try to reduce that risk to zero. Um, If the system doesn't behave like we tell you it's going to behave from being able to weld your parts, being able to hit the quality metrics that you need, being able to hit the cycle time that you want and desire, you just don't pay. And we come and take it back and you have no risk of utilizing or you, you don't have any risk of losing cash to see if something like this would work. 
Well, Andy, this was a great conversation. I really appreciate you doing this today and would love for you to tell our audience about, um, you know, where can they get in touch with you and learn more about Path Robotics? Thanks, Jeff. So uh, to get in touch with us, please go to www.path-robotics.com. That's our uh, new website. You can see the equipment that we're we're currently selling. You can sign up for a demo to come see the system live for yourself and understand how this can work for you uh, in the future. Beautiful. Well, Andy, thanks again for doing this today. And as for the rest of you, I hope to catch you on the next episode of the Manufacturing Executive.